Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. I'd like to show our audience today how to send in your questions, which our speaker will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Tonight, our moderator is Christina Davis. Christina is currently an adjunct professor at University of United States in San Diego, California, and Aspen University in Denver, Colorado. Christina has an extensive background in GI, digestive disorders, and both the treatment and diagnosis of GI and hepatic disorders. Her background includes clinical research through the NIH and FDA on infection-related topics. Christina, welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. Welcome to this four-module virtual workshop on endoscopic submucosal dissection. Today's session will focus on the first two modules. Module one, issues to consider before starting ESD practice, and module two, lesion selection. The presenter for this very important and current topic is a leading expert in the field, Dr. Mohammed Osman. Dr. Mohammed Osman is currently professor, Department of Internal Medicine, Gastroenterology, and Hepatology section at Baylor College of Medicine. He is Chief Gastroenterology Service, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, the William T. Butler Chair of Distinguished Faculty and Chair of Texas Division Digestive Disease Service Line Catholic Health Initiative. Dr. Osman has been the recipient of many awards, including Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center Innovator of the Year Award. He is actively involved in several research products funded by the NIH, including the study of chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer. He has published nearly 100 articles in peer reviewed journals and several book chapters. A highly sought after speaker, Dr. Osman has presented at numerous national and international medical conferences. The following are the speaker's disclosures. This activity has been approved for four AMA Category 1 credits and four CNE credits um, by completing both of the virtual workshops tonight and next Wednesday. The accreditation statement is below and support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. With that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Osman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for such a nice introduction. Um, we have a long night tonight, but we will make it very exciting. So thank you everyone for attending. We have two modules today and another two modules next week. And module one is about issues to consider before starting ESD practice. And before we start, I want to discuss why we built this program. We aim to have that as a comprehensive uh, education for whoever want to embark in performing ESD. And uh, a lot of time when people want to do ESD, they just jump to the procedure right away. However, there are several issues that if you know ahead of time, or if you know even when you are in your training of the procedure, it will help you to go to the next level. In this module one, which is issues to consider before starting ESD practice, we will answer some of these questions. So the learning objective of this module is to identify proper methods of training for ESD, describe the learning curve for ESD and method to shorten the process, discuss how to prepare the unit and the staff, and discuss the use of correct coding for each procedure. So before uh, we go into all these issues, I just want to talk a little bit about what's ESD. And I know uh, that the audience we have today, most of them are experienced uh, with ESD, but ESD is in block resection of gastrointestinal lesion, regardless of its size. The word is stand for endoscopic submucosal dissection. There is another word that's similar to it, which is EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection, and uh, honestly, between EMR and ESD, the dissection place is a submucosa. However, when we do ESD, we are using a specialized knife to allow us to resect lesions regardless of the size. We're seeing here two esophageal lesions. First one is esophageal adenocarcinoma. And you can see here where my cursor is going. That's an adenocarcinoma area. There's another focal area here. There's another one here. And there's nodular areas in the periphery. This patient was multi-nodular 
prepared to suffer against cancer slash high grade dysplasia. And the area is so large, and you can see we can identify that the tumor here, but we remove the tumor along with all the nodular area. And you can see here the squamous epithelium. And I don't know if the, the reflection is clear, but all of this is paired epithelium up to this area here. That's the squamous epithelium. So you can see we're taking a margin on the oral side, the anal side, and you can see that's 10 centimeter lesion. On the other side here, it's actually more exciting. That is a full circumferential mucosal resection of a squamous cell carcinoma, which is multifocal. Um, that was around eight centimeter, and because it was multifocal, that was circumferential ESD resection. Um, I'm not saying that every ESD will be like that, but that's showing you the extent and the power of ESD, that you can remove lesions like that, and it allows you to do things that maybe um, maybe you wouldn't be able to do it with EMR, and most of these patients would have been referred to surgery. So how to reach that point that would be able to remove lesions like that? Well, there is certain consideration. So that's right now, unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have any guidelines that talks about how you train for ESD and what you do for ESD. So I want you to forgive me that most of the guidelines I'm going to use will be Asian guidelines, but you'll find that I'm always having a preference for European guidelines because they're a little bit similar to us in terms of the situation of how they train for ESD. So that's the first slide you are seeing here. That's from the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And this was guidelines came in 2019, and they recommended, again, is unsupervised ESD, especially clonic ESD in the beginning. So I'm going to start with this. I'm going to make it clear. Unsupervised ESD, especially in the colon, is something you should always avoid doing. All right. I trained a lot of people in ESD, and uh, one of the worst things that could happen that people will come and attend one course and decide to go and do right side colonic lesion in their hospital. The case takes five to six hours and end up with perforation. The patient taken emergently to the OR at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. The surgeon come next day, talk to all his friends about this gastroenterologist who decided to perforate the colon and have been working for six hours trying to remove this and why they're doing this and that. So what we are doing when we don't really get trained very well? It's not only we are affecting ourselves and the view of our partner, our nurses, or technician on how we're doing things, but also the procedure itself became uh, less approved or less uh, known. So if you have many complications at the beginning, your surgeon and your referring physician would assume that the technique, this technique is very high risk and they will stop referring for that technique. And this is an uphill battle that I had to go in my area when I started my ESD practice. I would go and visit people and tell them refer this patient for ESD. And they told me, oh, you were referring them for endoscopic resection, and you guys keep have all this recurrence, bring them like every three months, and at the end, send them to surgery anyway. So we're gonna send this patient to surgery. So now, in our private practice uh, in the United States, it's much easier to refer larger benign lesion for right colonic uh, surgery, and they will have right hemocolectomy. So knowing that you really have to train very well before jumping in the colon is extremely important. So what else the ESG is recommending? They recommend a curriculum with careful patient selection, limited to lesion less than three centimeter, located in the antrum or the rectum for the first 20 procedures. So let me recall this again. When they looked at when somebody never did ESD before, what ESD they were successful at, they found that rectal lesion, anterior lesion, lesion that smaller than three centimeter are perfect to start with. You will be amazed about how many times I will get people telling me, I'm starting my first care clinic, Proctor May, I have a six centimeter lesion in the ascending colon. Uh, basically, they will send you the lesion that was not been able to be done by anybody, have been tried six times before, have a lot of submucosal fibrosis, and want that to be the first ESD. Uh, as we say here in Texas, it ain't gonna work. It's not gonna work this way. 
You cannot just start that way. So you want to find a lesion that has no submucosa of fibrosis. You want to find uh, a lesion that's small and an accessible area like the rectum so that if perforation happens, you have retroperitoneum, you don't have a lot of consequences. And also, later on, once you do a 100 procedure, you might get better, and that's what something we'll talk about. But I wanted to start with this slide about European guidelines, just to set up the stage about what, uh, what we should really expect. But by no means, I'm saying um, do not get trained for ESD. So it's another slide, and that's also another European guidelines about what is the best way from someone who want to do ESD, how you start, what you do. And the best way is that you have to have first basic preconditions. So if you are alone in a small practice in a city of 6,000 people, it's unrealistic to say, I'm going to do ESD. You have to be in a place that you have enough patient getting referred to you and or at least you have a partners you are a group of five people and you decided to be the one who's going to be doing the emr and esd and first you want to be experienced in emr there's a lot of transfers transferable experience between emr to esd some of these factors including um injection how to inject very well uh, lesion recognition and we're going to talk uh, in this session about how to recognize lesions and um, in the meantime, too, once you know that and people know that you are doing EMR and they send you patients, it will be easier for you to transfer your EMR practice into ESD. But it's very hard if nobody knows about you as an EMR specialist or resection specialist, and all of a sudden you want to do ESD. So that's also something I noticed, especially was very successful pancreatic mobility endoscopist. So there will be the best advanced endoscopist doing 600 to 1,000 ERCV a year. Then he said, and I'm going to do ESD too. But then he doesn't spend time and dedicate time to it. And he also want to quickly do the case. It's not going to work this way. So the basic re recondition is referral center, experience in EMR, some experience. I'm not saying senior endoscopist, but some experience as an endoscopist in what you're doing. Then you have to start the phase one with planning. You have to make a structural decision, which mean by that, I mean by that is that your unit, you're gonna do a case that might take you two, three hours, maybe four hours at the beginning. And um, you have to know that you should not do that by the end of the day. So I think this is happening all the time. Uh, people say, I'm gonna do ESD today, my first case, and have another five, six cases before it. And he get this busy, bit tough case in ARCP and remove all the stones, do another two US and at three o'clock when he's tired, his staff is tired, want to start the ESD. You can't do that. So you have to really know that, okay, may I should we have an ESD day? Maybe that day is when I start doing this procedure, I'm going to block it. So these are some of the things you have to think about. Uh, then preparatory training. In my opinion, this preparatory training, that phase two, is one of the most important phases in learning ESD. It's when you decide to go attend workshops, to go attend uh, proctorship, watch people who are working, and start doing hands-on training on uh, animal model, explant, and then you go for life models. And if you tell me how many hours in animal before I start to say I feel good, not less than 20 hours. And some of them will be under supervision, some of them will be on your own. Uh, you know, one of the attendees uh, today is Dr. Tara Kaihanian. She's my fellow, uh, used to be my fellow. And when she was a fellow, now she's my partner. She used to just take a Saturday and for four to five hours, dedicate her time to do ESD and animal models. She kept doing this for extensive amount of hours that when she came to work in human uh, and doing human case, it becomes second nature and it become much easier. So I really recommend, again, it's doing one training or one, uh, one animal model training for two hours and think you're ready. I will tell you, hands-on training has to be at least, at least 20 hours. So you finish that phase two preparatory, then you want to go to do clinical ESD. And that's when you're going to do your first 40 to 50 cases. So when you do the first 40 to 50 cases, what you want to choose? Rectal lesion or lesions in the esophagus or the anterior. Do want to start with tough one and then later on you're going to become skilled once you get more than 80 cases and then you're going to start looking at your 
um, you know, uh, curative resection rate, and you really want to look for your R0 resection rate. So once you pass stage three, you cannot just continue to do ESDs without having your own data. You have to learn how long it takes you to do the case, what's your dissection speed, what's your R0 resection rate, what's your M block resection rate. So all these definitions are very important, and we're going to go through them and what they mean. But in block mean in one piece, R0 resection means that the margins are negative and you should know all this stuff. You cannot be an ESD reference center if your R0 resection rate is not 80% uh, or higher. So you have to strive to get that. A lot of people would say, I do ESD. But if you do ESD and most of you, half of your cases is not in block, that's not an ESD. So, do we have learning curve experience in the United States? That's one of the only published studies from the United States, which is a study um, here by Zhang Gutal, and this would be uh, the group uh, in New York, Dr. Stavros. And in his experience, he noticed that it took him more than 300 cases till he get to the dissection speed of nine centimeter square per hour. So what is nine centimeter square? It is three by three centimeter. So in order to dissect three, three, three centimeter in one hour, he required 300 cases. It's another study here in this hour experience uh, from um, my personal experience, and I'm working that with one of my colleagues, uh, Mike Calaf and uh, others, and Ferris, uh, you, but we looked at our experience here in Houston in 600 cases and we looked at how consistently you can achieve n block resection rate like when you say most likely 95 percent or 90 percent of the time he is going to do n block resection rate it took us 268 cases okay i know i know that when you say things like that people will get disappointed they will feel like how come it will take all this time, maybe I shouldn't do it. I would like to remind you that for ERCB training, you cannot be evaluated till you do at least 180, and then you wouldn't be good at it till you do more than 500. US, most of the people will say you need between 200 to 400. So why when it comes to ESD, everybody wanna learn it in four, four cases? It's not gonna be like that. So what does that mean? It means that you have to continue to push yourself to do the procedure. Are you going to be able to do end block for all the patients at the beginning? No. Some cases you will be able to, other you will not be able to, and you will have to make sure that you track your progress and that you are doing better. You Even after you start doing clinical cases, you will benefit from watching other providers. Uh, you will benefit from doing additional training. Every time we'd work an animal model, even if you know how to do ESD, it will help you to get better. So basically, I'm not saying, uh, like, don't do it. I'm saying do it, but do not get frustrated. So there are patterns when I train people. And I'll tell you about one of the patterns. I told you about one pattern that I trained them. And the first case they go and do is colonic ESD in the right side of the colon. They perforate. They never do ESD before. That's one pattern. But there is another pattern that I know that they're very good in what they're doing. They are very meticulous. They spend the time to learn ESD and they do a lot of animal models. Then they go to human and they start doing cases. They do one, two, three, four, fifteen, but they are not patient enough to see the fruit of their work. After 15 cases, they found that oh, I was only able to do like six out of 15 in end block and the other I had to resort to snare. Maybe this is not for me, I will stop doing it. Or maybe this is too much, I'm not gonna do it. So that pattern is that you ask him, do you do ESD? He says, yes, when was the last case? Two years ago. He knows how to do ESD, he learned ESD, but he decided not to push himself or herself to the next level. How are you going to push yourself to the next level? You will have to continue training and training and training and monitor your cases till you get to the level that ESD becomes second nature for you. That's not going to happen in 10 or 15 cases. That's going to happen after 260 cases, as you see here. So that's my own personal experience. The previous slide, as you can see here, 
that's Dr. Stavros uh, experience. So we will have two advanced endoscopies in the United States equipped in that time. But I want to reassure you, at the time we start training, I started in 2011, he started in 2008. At that time, there was not a lot of people in the United States doing it. We had to go somewhere else. Our learning curve was longer. I will tell you right now, the learning curve of my trainee, such as Dr. Kaihani, and I mentioned earlier, is much faster. And Dr. Salman Jaweed was my partner, who was one of the first fellows in the United States to be trained under Vera Dragunov. They are much faster than what they are doing. It's still, they need time. It's still, they will take maybe, maybe 100 cases instead of 200, but there is a steep learning curve. Knowing that will help you to avoid disappointment. Because one of the things they found that when people fear ESD, they lose confidence in themselves. So I'm here to tell you, I'm coming from your future to tell you, do not get disappointed in that case when you fail and when you have to resort to EMR or when you have a complication. And I will tell you, you also had post-ERCP pancreatitis before and that did not prevent you from doing ERCP. So keep doing it and don't get scared of complication over the long time. And uh, other people who really become successful in this, they really needed more time and you can do it too. So let's talk about ESD on the West. Now we know the learning curve. Now I made you know that you are here for the long term. This is a marathon, not a splint. And knowing that is a marathon, you're gonna take a deep breath and say, so how can I build that practice? So we have a big problem in the United States about ESD. Uh, ESD had a bad reputation in 2011, 12, and 13. And that what happened is when the technique started in Japan in the early 2000s, um, many of the people, uh, many of the people who uh, did the procedure were actually endoscopists who have a lot of biliary experience. They tried ESD. They didn't do the stuff we talked about before. And guess what happened after that? They just said ESD is a high risk. We are not going to do it. EMR is better. So it became in all reflected in all guidelines in the United States. We don't have ESD mentioned anywhere. And I'm gonna show you after that the guidelines and how it's talking about it. So right now people tell you to, why you do all this, spend all this time doing ESD? You can just send the patient for surgery. And, and they'll tell them, well, it is much better technique. They'll tell you what the, what the evidence. You tell them, here's the Asian literature. And they'll say, but we do not have literature, literature from the United States. And that's why me and others are working very hard to produce this American experience. So, Let's see here what the challenge. In Japan, when they train, train people for ESD, they start with the easy lesion, which is lesion in the antrum. The stomach pole is very thick. The antrum area is so hard to perforate in it. The muscle is like almost two centimeter. They're not gonna cut it at all. So I, when I went there, I saw how they train their people. It's so easy. They just start the case in the antrum and tell them keep working. They go slowly, work for an hour, hour and a half, then the attending come and take it from him and complete it, but they are working in a safe area. For us, we don't have the luxury of early gastric cancer. As you can see here, even the incidence of gastric cancer in the United States is very low. Even if we start the, like figuring out all these early cases of gastric cancer, we're not gonna find enough. We don't have enough of these cases. And I'm gonna tell you they are seeing the same in Japan too that they're having less gastric cases and more colonic cases. So that's the challenge for us. So what is the alternative? Although gastric cancer is not common in the United States, we can see here that esophageal cancer is on the rising. So that's the incidence of esophageal cancer over the year. We can see how it was in 1960 and 70. You see how now it is in the United States. So it is going higher in the United States. So esophageal adenocarcinoma might be the perfect target for minimal invasive techniques. If you live in an area where you have a lot of Barrett esophagus and high-grade dysplasia, then you can convert your EMR practice into ESD. But in order to have a successful ESD practice, what really was constitute that successful program? You really have to address the need of your population. So if you are gonna wait for this one case of gastric cancer to show up, 
you're never going to do ESD because it might take one year. And that is the third type of people I train, which I don't want you to be like them. They get trained, they are good, they understand the importance of ESD, but opposite to type one who will go and do this right side colonic lesion, that one is waiting for the perfect anterior lesion. So I meet him in every DDW and ACG, our hair, hi, did you start? Well, they didn't do it. Why? Well, I couldn't find an anterior lesion. Well, if there's no anterior lesion, you have to find something else. We know we're not doing ESD and going to create patient for it. We have to use ESD to address the problem of our population. So what are the problems of our population? It's two things, esophageal adenocarcinoma and colonic lesions. So you have to provide that value by that technique the value of removing this lesion and while you are doing organ preserving procedure. Also, if you have in your hospital a uh, program uh, that have patient coming to it, that could complement by ESD. So for example, if you have Barrett screening program, you can do it. If you have a pulvectum or EMR program, you can convert your EMR or some of them into ESD. So what are the prerequisites for success for pulvectomy program? Number one, you have to have on board excellent endoscopy team. You have to have supporting hospital administration. What I mean by that, I will tell you one of my first case. It took me like three hour and a half to do EGD with ESD. And one of the anesthesia doctor sent a complaint to the hospital saying, that doctor took him three hour and a half to do a simple EGD. That was not a simple EGD. This was EGD with ESD. But I learned from that complaint that I failed to teach everyone what is ESD and why we're doing it. So really having this explanation and telling people what you're doing and put them on board is very important. After that, like fast forward nine years later, we have anesthesia who are really understanding what ESD is, what POM is. They know exactly what type of anesthesia you'll do for this patient, but that comes with communication. And also the hospital have to understand the value of this program. And having this value depend on, um, I would say, where you practice. So for certain hospital, their value is not that you are not doing uh, uh, surgeries because they benefit from surgery. So if you go to your CEO and tell them, and I'm going to save you having all this right hemocolectomy, they will just like get chest pain. They worried, oh my goodness, we need this hemocolectomy. But you're going to tell him if we're going to get referral that they will know not going to come to us. They will come to us just because we're doing this procedure. They'll be excited. If you are in a system like Kaiser where there is a value in saving money and you tell them saving the patient surgery, they'll understand that. So you have to understand what really is the hospital uh, rule and hospital administration that they're looking for. But overall, you can remind them that we really care about the patient. So patient care, and we have to provide something uh, that's organ preserving. And if we don't do it, somebody else in town will be doing it, and we're going to lose our practice because we're not moving forward. Uh, continuous education of referring physician is very important. You are not going to be successful in having an ESD practice if you really do not communicate with your referring physician continuously showing them picture of before and after, telling them what you can remove. You will be surprised that a lot of them wouldn't even know that this ESD technique exists and they cannot imagine the type of lesion can be removed with them. So having brochure that have images, grand round talks, website updates, one-to-one uh, -one conversation, all of that will help you to build the practice you want. So remember all of this uh, anywhere you are doing uh, a practice. So that's part again about the hospital administration and how to talk to them. You know, uh, I remember when I started my ESD practice for esophageal lesion, one of the very famous surgeon, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, he told me, and he was old school, and he said, you know what, you have to do esophagectomy for high grade dysplasia. Whatever you are doing is a little bit um, controversial. I showed him the data. He said, you have to do this under research protocol. And there was a big surprise our volume of esophagectomy doubled once we started ESD program. We call that the downstream revenue from surgery. So sometimes surgeons will be worried that you are doing organ preserving procedure, but when you do enough of them and you get too many of them, some of these patients will be advanced that they need to go for surgery, and other, after you resect them, they will have high risk sign that you need to send them for surgery. So basically, you have to explain that to the hospital, 
You have to explain to them the cost saving to the entire system. You have to remind them that if you want to be your hospitals to be ranked and in the US ranking system, that's something you have to tell them about. And you also have to focus on their uh, referral pattern and tell them, well, look, we are getting all these cases from another hospital. They wouldn't come here unless we're offering these. So all of that I, I offered you right now, I call them talking points. These are the talking points that you can get your hospital to be supporting you and allowing you to do this for a long period of time because you're going to take the room initially for three, four hours and they wonder why you're doing that, why you have to invest in that. You have to tell them in the long term that will pay off. So the next question we're going to ask you, all right, so how much are you going to make from this procedure? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that we do not have a code for ESD. So what is the pending process? So what I learned, and I'm going to give you right now, is my experience doing this. We know with POM right now we have the code, but for ESD, we use unlisted code. But the process I'm going through is not reauthorization, but it's called voluntary predetermination request, which means that you take the case to the insurance and tell them, regardless of what you think, I'm not going to do this case till one, somebody in your insurance determine should I do it or not? So basically that request can take two weeks to one to 30 days. So obviously it's not going to be for every patient, but it will be perfect for a patient with chronic polyps or patient who can wait two to three weeks. If you do a lot of these cases, you'll discover that denial is high. So you have to be careful about it. And I'm going to show you here uh, data about that, about how that denial is much higher. Uh, and we'll get to it. And because of that, I really have to go through this predetermination process. So another thing to, in, your, uh, in this type of procedure we just we talked about, the, in addition to anesthesia, is a technician and nurse. If you're gonna do this procedure, and this my team here from Baylor St. Luke's, uh, that they owe them, uh, all what we're doing, they supported me for the last 10 years, in this procedure, you cannot train all this endoscopy unit here. You have to train some people and realize that two to three teams is good. So I know in the United States, we're all about cross-training. Everybody can do everything. But cross-training to ESD will mean that nobody will be trained. The number of procedures is not that much. You cannot cross-train every person to do ESD. So as a result, you have to realize that two to three teams are good. One team is not enough because if they are not around, how are we going to do the procedure? Two teams are okay, but after a while, they're going to complain. I will tell you three teams are perfect to train initially. So if you have three technicians and three nurse trained, that would be very good. That will take you for at least two to three years, and then you can teach other people. So going back to what we do again, we write also in addition to this predetermination, in our billing process, I write a letter of medical necessity for each and every patient. This patient has this type of polyps. If we remove it by surgery, this is what will happen. What is ESD procedure? I also send them uh, a lot of supporting document. And one of them is the paper that we wrote, clinical practice update from the American Gastroenterology Association, showing what the ESD indication. And we also send data about the ESD efficacy. I really recommend you to look at this AGA clinical practice update for ESD 2019 and you'll find all this data there. So how successful were with reimbursement? This was one of the papers that got published this year by our group, talking about uh, reimbursement for physicians from 136 free patients. That's only physician reimbursement. I do not have hospital data, and you can see here, we charge 2,800, but the mean payment rate was 800 for the upper esophageal ESD, 1,300 for chronic ESD, 700 for gastric ESD. Um, and you can see here, if you divide it by hour, this is what's the main payment per hour. If you want to put it in context, EMR, you get paid between 106 in our hospital to 529, depending on insurance. Open collectomy, 1300 to 2000. Lab collectomy, 1300 to, one, to 2000. That is the physician reimbursement part. So, so far here, you'll say, wow, you are getting good amount. It's not high but it's reasonable, but that's because we go through the process of voluntary predetermination. If you're just gonna do every case comes to you without determining and talking to the insurance, 
not pre-authorization, but predetermination. If you don't do the predetermination, you might risk that half of your cases will not get paid, and someone from your administration will come and talk to you and say, well, maybe this procedure is experimental and we should not uh, be doing it. So uh, with that part right now, we are concluding module one. I want to just recap some of the important things we talked about in that module. One of the important things is recognize the learning curve, how steep it is. And uh, number two, know that before you jump into doing clinical cases, you have to have adequate training and animal. And number three, understand that it's not only about learning the procedure, but it's all about the environment around it. From your nurse, your technician, your anesthesia, your hospital staff, you're arranging your room, arranging your schedule. Do not put your case at the end of the day. Do not block ESD at the beginning for one hour. You might need three or four hours and also know how to bill correctly. Uh, if anybody have question, I will stop uh, for a few uh, minutes here after module one, before we start module two to see if we have any question. But at the end, we're gonna open the discussion definitely uh, at the end. All right, so I will move now to module two, which is lesion selection for ESD. The objective of this module is to discuss the proper indication of ESD in each anatomic site. Describe the different needs for ESD between the East and the West, and discuss the high risk associated, uh, high risk associated performing certain ESDs, like duodenal ESD, and I'm gonna touch on that. All right, just to be upfront with you, I'm very sorry that this module will be a little bit dull, but honestly, I will call this module the meat of ESD. If you wanna do ESD, you really have to understand this module very well. I might spend more time focusing on it and going through the indications, because if you don't understand the indication, maybe ESD would be not the perfect procedure for some of your patients, and you may run into adverse events. So let's first understand this concept, which is very hard to explain to our patient, um, but we should be able uh, to do that. So, which is when you have a lesion like that, you can see here's a mucosa, submucosa, muscle layer. You might be able, like this tumor here in stage one, to remove it completely because it's limited to the submucosa. But outside the lumen, there is this lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes will send lymphatic follicle or vessel. This lymphatic follicle are really rich in the muscle layer, but they also can extend to the submucosa, and in certain situations, they can even be in the deep mucosa here. So why that is important? Because you might achieve complete removal of the lesion, but then this lesion could be already penetrating the lymph node. So the game of ESD, and I call it the ESD game, is predicting the risk of lymph node metastasis. Why this is important, and I wanna put you on the stage for that. The stage is, you, you have a esophageal lesion, you completely remove it, you do, um, CT scan and PET scan, everything is fine. You tell the patient you have a curative resection. Patient comes three years later with liver meds. No primary, they biopsy it, it's adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. What is going on here? What's happening here is that although the primary lesion is removed, the lead, the, the, there was a lymph node metastasis that was not detected, which presented later on. As an endoscopist now, if you are in parking doing ESD, now you are in this stage between EMR and surgery. When you're doing the EMR, you're just talking about things that's very superficial, limited to the mucosa. Now, when you dissect deep enough, you're gonna run into the risk of lymphovascular invasion and you have to think like a surgeon. 
and surgeons always think about curative resection. It's not only clean margin, it is resection for cure. So how can you ensure curative resection? You want to look at the statistical chances of the lesion going to the lymph node. So all what I'm going to spend with you right now is to explain what are the lesions that we think they are good for ESD. And they are good for ESD because we think that when we remove them at this stage, they did not reach to the lymph node yet. And that's when surgery came. Why surgery is better than ESD in certain situations? Because when you remove the entire esophageal lumen, you also remove the lymph node with it. So theoretically, if you are able to do a surgery to remove the lesion, all the lymph nodes around it, and ensure that it is cured, that's great. Or if you can even give chemotherapy after ESD, this is another option. People are playing with these options. But if you're going to do ESD, you have to start understanding what are the proper indications. So now let's start first with the Japanese criteria for ESD of gastric lesion. Why am I starting with this? This is where ESD started. So if you want to learn a technique, you want to learn a history, you have to go back to the original data. This is the original scripture, as they say. When ESD started, it started for a standard criteria. We call it the standard criteria for gastric ESD, which is a tumor less than two centimeter, which is differentiated adenocarcinoma. That is our standard criteria. That's how ESD started in Japan. Tumor, less than two centimeter, well differentiated. When they became good at it, they started to say, let's expand the criteria a little bit. For example, we can do lesion that's less than two uh, centimeter, that's slightly larger than two centimeter, yes, we can do it, but still they have to be differentiated. Or maybe undifferentiated tumor, but less than two centimeter or maybe ulcerated lesion less than three centimeter, or maybe differentiated tumor that's going to the submucosa, but only the upper third of the submucosa. So you tell me how do you know what's upper from middle from lower? Well, actually they'll measure it. The first 500 micromillimeter is the upper third of the submucosa in the gastric, uh, gastric lesions. So what all, all this read, this is non-curative criteria. If you have an ulcerated lesion larger than three centimeter, even if it is differentiated, most likely it went to the lymph node. And most likely, if you remove it and you have margins that are negative, this patient will come back with metastasis. So let's have an uh, experience that you remove the lesion based on a biopsy saying it is differentiated. And this lesion ends up being three centimeter. But when you send it for ESD, the result came back undifferentiated or poorly differentiated. You're going to talk to the patient and tell him, I'm sorry, I removed that lesion. I totally took it out. All the margins are negative, but because it has an ulcer and it is undifferentiated, that's high risk for you going to the lymph node. I'm going to send you for surgery. Not only that, you're going to tell him, and there's a possibility when I send you to the surgery, that when they do the surgery and remove the stomach, they will find nothing. I know it's a very difficult discussion, but you will have to have it to your patient. Your patient will ask you right away, so statistically speaking, what is this risk of lymph node metastasis? So you have to explain it to them. So this is a meta-analysis that we did in 2018. And at that time, we looked at the, all the study that talked about lymph node metastasis and even for lesions that we consider safe, which is absolute versus expanding criteria. So let's see here, from every uh, 1,000 patient who will have a two centimeter lesion in the stomach, which is differentiated, from every 1,000, two of them may have lymph node metastasis. It's very low, it's acceptable risk. But you see here, for the overall expanded criteria, from every 1,000, there's seven patients of the expanded criteria could have lymph node metastasis. It still is acceptable. But when we went into the details of all the expanded criteria one by one, there is two of them standing out here. Undifferentiated tumor and differentiated going to submucosa invasion. 
both of them from every thousand patients, you have 25 to 26 who will come back with lymph node metastasis later on. So the message of this meta-analysis was for everyone performing this procedure based on the Japanese criteria to know that you'll have to have this discussion with your patient and telling him there is a risk of 2.6% that although everything removed, it is in the lymph node. And he will tell you, what do you mean by that? You tell him, you have to understand the risk. You want to go for surgery based on 2%, that's fine. If you want to have chemotherapy, that's fine. If you want to go for surgery, that's fine. I give my patient all options and they always involve surgeons and oncologists in these discussions. So when you work in this field of ESD, now you almost assume or take in the hat of oncologists, and sometimes you will need the real oncologist to be in that discussion too. So later on, we only did a look at uh, risk of lymph node metastasis just for gastric submucosal lesion, and you can see here, it's variable, some of them have 0%, other has up to 14 or 15% of patients who have submucosal invasion, gastric submucosal invasion had lymph node metastasis. So that taught us that do not take it easy with Asian going to the submucosa. You should always have this discussion with your patient and tell them that they have to have surveillance, PET scan, and we watch for it. So now we spoke about the gastric ESD. Now I explained the criteria which we call uh, expanded and absolute criteria, because you're gonna hear this word, and I, I wanna drill it into you. Less than two centimeter, non-ulcerated, differentiated type, that's your best thing ever. You can push it to three centimeter, while it is differentiated, that's fine. You can take ulcer, but small lesion, that's fine. If it is undifferentiated, if it's less than two centimeter, you can remove it, and by the way, we have also other data showing that undifferentiated type, no matter what, cannot be good. And submucosal SM1 may be okay, but have a slightly higher risk of lymph node metastasis. So now what are the criteria, Japanese criteria for esophageal ESD? So remember in Japan, they have more of a, a squamous cell rather than adenocarcinoma. So for them, their absolute indication is a non-invasive squamous cell carcinoma or intermucosal squamous cell carcinoma, which is M1 and M2 lesion, and anything less than two-thirds of the circumference. Their other indication is a deeper lesion of 200 micromillimeter submucosa M3 and S1. You can do them, but know that it could be problematic, and know that the risk of lymph node metastasis in this category is 10%. In the United States, we don't have this criteria for squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, we're not going to see a lot of them but you're gonna see adenocarcinoma. So anytime you will have a nodular lesion larger than two centimeter, we recommend based on the AGA guidelines that you remove them. And uh, basically this is one of the things that we uh, uh, talked about uh, in the United States is that nodular Barrett esophagus, you cannot just RFA it. You either have to do EMR or ASD. If you have high grade dysplasia or early cancer for a lesion that's more than three centimeter, there is a guideline it's going to come from the ASGA that will say favor ESD over EMR. This guidelines is not, it did not come out yet, but it was finalized. That's why I'm talking about it, because it's already written, it's already approved, and it will be published very soon. And for the first time, we're going to have a guidelines in the United States addressing EMR versus ESD for birth esophagus. I'm very excited about it because it will come later this year, and it led, uh, it's a great effort led by Dr. Al Haddad uh, and Bashar Kumsia. Both of them did an amazing uh, effort uh, along with Peter uh, Dragunov and I and others who helped them in these guidelines. So now, uh, just to put everything in perspective, knowing that the SM1 lesion are the only one you remove is because SM2 and SM3 they really have high risk of submucosal invasion and a, a high risk of lymph node metastasis. You can see here, based on all these trials, this lesion can go to 50% lymph node metastasis. So if you have a lesion beyond this 500 micromillimeter in the gastric cancer or 200 micromillimeter in esophageal cancer, then these patients should go for surgery. All right, if you have a pathologist who is new and have been not doing this for a long time, and you're gonna go and tell them, I'm doing ESD, you better introduce all this concept to them. You have to tell them, I'm looking for lymphovascular invasion 
and I want you to look for this, and I want you to look for the deep of, uh, of invasion and measure it by micromillimeter. And they might be confused where to measure it. Well, you're gonna measure it from the end of the muscularis mucosa. And you're gonna have situation that you will have what we call duplication of the muscularis mucosa. What we mean by that, there is certain situation that in vert esophagus, that the muscularis mucosa will become two layers and you'll have glands in between. And uh, we show that when you have a duplication of submucosa, you'll use the lower one, not the upper one. Otherwise, you can incorrectly stage SM1 as SM2. So let me repeat this again. You cannot measure from up here. Well, that's more for the pathologist. So you measure from the end of the muscularis mucosa, M and M. That's where you measure, right? Because I had somebody start measuring from up there to measure the depth of submucosa. It doesn't work this way. It has to be end of muscularis mucosa. If this muscularis mucosa, which is the red part, is separated or splitted, so it will be like upper part and lower part, you start always from the lower part. So why I'm telling you this? Because as a gastroenterologist, you might have an opportunity to teach your pathologist. So remember that and remind them, I would like you to measure the depths of submucosa in patient starting from the end of muscularis mucosa. Now I'm gonna shift gear into colonic lesion. And I want you to just take a deep breath because that's part, you're gonna do a lot of it, either for EMR or ESD. You can see here, this is the US uh, Multi-Society Task Force. This was led by a lot of author. The first one was Tanya uh, Klattenbach, and she did amazing work on these guidelines. If for anyone who's doing ESD, I really highlight this guidelines. I would like you to read it. It's amazing. It will it's published in GIE and Gastro and Red Journal because it's multi society task force. And basically, it identifies the regions for you based on Paris classification. So, the Paris classification is a surface morphology. You look at the surface and you decide how deep or how uh, superficial is the lesion. So, you can see here any lesions that's pedunculated, this Paris. Uh, zero uh, one if it is flat it is two and you can see here flat flat to to be slightly elevated to a depressed is to see and if you really have deep absolute lesion this will be paris o-3 or we will call it type c paris how this would translate this one here with a deep ulcer that's really could be three this one here with slight depression could be two c this one here is slightly elevation, is 2A. This one here, pedunculated, this is sile. And if you have a pedunculated polyp, this would be 1P. So these are examples of the lesions you can see. But it can get into more interesting when you have lesions that have multiple things together. So you're going to get this, what we call Paris 2A, 2C, or Paris 2C, 2A. And I wrote that to GIA in 2019 explaining the difference between both of these lesions. Because one of them, which is here, is very benign. You can remove it with ESD, and this one, you can't. So if you have a 2C, this is an ulcerated lesion with a raised area, this is 2C, 2A. If it is 2C, or even type 3, that's very ulcerated, versus you have 2A, which is a flat lesion, was slightly depressed. What I mean by that, the lesion by itself is raised. But in the middle of the area that is raised, you have a depression. You're going to see this a lot. And why I'm talking about this sophistication, you're going to wonder right now, Othman is going crazy here, talking about Paris, all this classification, because that's something you're going to see in everyday practice. You're going to see there's a dimple area, or you're going to see there's a point that is going down like this one, but the lesion looks benign. But, but you say, okay, but depressed lesion shouldn't be removed by ESD. That depression here, is not that the same like that depression. That depression here is deep enough, is ulcerated, it is going to the submucosa. That depression here is a depression in elevated area. And once you recognize that, you're gonna feel much better about removing some lesion that you can incorrectly think they are um, deep lesion, but they are not. So that's why I'm highlighting this part. Recognize the depression in elevated lesions. This here, um, showing the risk of lymph node metastasis based on Paris classification. What's the message here? 
lymph node metastasis up to 60% in type uh, 2C. So anything that have really depression or type 3, as we can see here, is very high. So let's look at another classification, granular versus non-granular lateral spreading tumor. So we learned with time that polyps they can grow like a tree, we call it bedonculated polyps, but they also can grow like a carpet, like weeds on the, if you have your garden and you have the weeds, they spread horizontal, they spread like uh, in lateral spreading. So we came up with this new term called LST, which is lateral spreading tumor. And when we looked at this lateral spreading tumor, we found them to be either granular or non-granular. And there is a mixed granular and non-granular type. And it's one of the most beautiful study here that we can see that the granular type, um, the risk of submucosa invasion at 3.2%. The non-granular type, which is number D here, and I would like you to see this versus that, because these are one of the region we see a lot in our practice. We always see that lesion. This is actually our favorite lesion for ESD, especially in the rectum. That's what we call granular LST. Granular EST is your friend. The risk of submucosa invasion is less than 3% or 3.2%. Non-granular though, it is 15%. It might be worse doing ESD, but by no means you're gonna do EMR here. And if you do ESD, you might end up sending the patient for surgery too. So knowing the difference between granular and non-granular LST is important. And also knowing that there's sometimes you'll have heterogeneous granularity some granules are larger than others, and that also can affect uh, the outcome. So here, as you can see here, the granular versus sun granular is the main thing is you have to look for presence of large nodule. So if you must do this with EMR, focus on getting the large nodule in one piece and send it separate for pathology, because that would be the one, obviously, that have a problem. But I would really highly encourage you not to do that and remove this lesion with ESD. So these are some of the certain feature, larger nodule and large tumor size, more than two centimeter. So knowing that, it tells you that even based on this type of classification here, like the Paris classification, any type two lesion and type three, if you're gonna embark in endoscopic resection, takes that one like that, you shouldn't even do endoscopy, that has to go for surgery. But if it has slight depression, you will have to do ESD. Uh, if you have a lesion like this one here, definitely only ESD, no EMR, and maybe surgery if it has a deeper ulcer. If you have a lesion like that, depend on how large the granules, based on this study here, if you have a large nodule more than 10 millimeter, then that will have a high risk of submucosa invasion. Then you better dissect deeper in the submucosa and do ESD. But also there's other things that could help us, which one of them is the NICE classification. So NICE classification now it is approved uh, because it became part of the standard of care in uh, Japan. But it's, I have to warn you that it's based only on uh, NBI, narrowband imaging, which means that it is limited for Olympus scope users. And so if you are using Pentax scope, if you're using uh, Fuji, it's not gonna be NICE classification you're gonna have something similar to it, uh, but it's not narrowband imaging. And that classification here you can see, it's simple, hyperplastic like this one. That's how adenomatous looks like, and this how submucosa invasion looks like. Very simple, people loved it, but once they start using it, they discovered that there's a difficulty differentiating high-grade dysplasia and submucosa invasion from low-grade dysplasia, because the jump from adenoma into submucosa invasion, leaving this very important high grade dysplasia stage, because that's one here, you're not gonna do anything for type one. Type two, EMR. Type three, surgery. So where is the type that you're gonna do for EST? Nice classification does not have this type. Um, so if you look here at the GNET, Japan MBI expert team classification, they decided to go to this type two and decided into two other types and basically is this regular one that was here as a type two adenomatous polyp became type 2A. Uh, it has a regular surface pattern, 
and it has a blood vessel have a regular uh, distribution but sometimes you can get this irregular or obscure pattern with variable carnivore or thickened blood vessel but it's not that crazy like this one you see here when it becomes very amorphous this is deep submucosa invasion so type one dots this nice dots hyperblastic pulp do nothing to it unless in the right side of the colon enlarge this might be sessile surveyed here is type 2a here is type 2b and that's type 3 so type 2b esd type 2a emr type 3 is surgery this is another classification only for polyps that is pedunculated and that is pathological classification. When you have a pedunculated polyp, you better remove it as deep as you can. That's why even for this type of polyp, I start to do submucosa dissection, because you can see here, sometimes we can have adenocarcinoma on the surface, sometimes we can go to the neck of the polyp, but sometimes we can go all the way to the submucosa, and the deeper it go is the higher risk of uh, invasion. So the colon, unlike uh, the esophagus and the stomach, uh, SM1 have very low risk of lymph node metastasis, 2%, and even SM2, 9%. We're learning more and more that early uh, colon cancer can be removed by endoscopy. So this is a new message, 2022 and 23. We're learning now that actually you can remove the stricter lesion and colonic lesion by endoscopy, even if they have submucosa invasion. So remember by definition, the, the American definition, there's nothing called mucosal uh, colonic adenocarcinoma. So there's something you should know. In Barrett esophagus, it could be limited to the mucosa and you can say submucosa invasion. But in the United States, the definition of colonic adenocarcinoma, it has to have a component of submucosa invasion because if it's not invading submucosa and limited to the mucosa, we are gonna call it intramucosal adenocarcinoma. We're not gonna call it colonic adenocarcinoma, or some people will call it high-grade dysplasia. They removed the term intramucosal and it became high-grade dysplasia. So high-grade dysplasia in the, in the colon means that it is early cancer limited to the mucosa, and knowing that the colon, the lymph node does not reach the mucosa, this is safer uh, uh, to remove this lesion with EMR, but if you're going to the submucosa, now it is adenocarcinoma, and for SM1, and people argue now even SM2, you can remove them by ESD. So you should know that there is no risk of lymph node metastasis and submucosal invasion depths less than 3,000 in bronchiolated lesion or submucosal invasion less than 1,000 in non bedunculated lesions. So what are the predictor of lymph node metastasis? Um, depths of submucosal invasion up to 2,000 if you see on the pathology venous invasion, poorly differentiated tumor, mucinous adenocarcinoma, or tumor body. So let's go back to the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force. They talked here about if there is no invasion, lesion is 10 to 19 millimeter, you can do cold hot snare or EMR. Larger lesion, EMR, um, maybe you can try to burn around the margin. But when you suspect submucosa invasion based on the above, see what they said here. EMR or ESD if complete resection is feasible and safe. Unfortunately, they did not go into should we do EMR or ESD, and that will be the next thing we're pushing ASGE to do. We want clear guidelines from the US societies about when EMR or ESD will happen. I'm glad to share with you that I'm a part of the European effort to clarify that question, EMR versus ESD, for the European counterpart. However, uh, in the United States, this should happen, and we should not leave it that vague that if we suspect submucosa invasion, do EMR, ESD. But as of now, that's what we have from our societies in the United States. The ACG published in 2015, paper by uh, Bart Edo, who suggested that we should do ESD for LST is non-granular between two to three centimeter, based on the 15% risk of lymph node metastasis. Anything larger than three centimeter, that latter is spreading and granular. Any residual recurrent tumor, two centimeter or higher. Any rectal carcinoid between one to two centimeter. 
I really found this criteria very reasonable. I highly advise you, if you know how to do ESD in the rectum and advancing your training to do it in the colon, you can use it. This is what I do in my practice. Larger granular blood respiring more than three centimeter, non-granular two centimeter, or less two centimeter, but there's residual or recurrent tumor or a lot of fibrosis. So that's here. We talked about our U.S. Malta Society Task Force, about the ACG. Now let's look at the Japanese again, because we did not mention them in the colon. So their opinion is totally different. Their first criteria is you do ESD when M block resection is not feasible with EMR. And for people who work with me, they know I do that. I always like to do M block. And I know this argument about well, you don't need M block and everything, but I feel that it's always having M block resection is better. So the first thing is Japanese criteria. If you think M block resection is not feasible by EMR, which means the lesion is large enough, more than two centimeter, to do ESD. If you have LSDs non granular, they always do ESD. If you have codotype 4 pit pattern, which is a chromoendoscopy pattern, do it. If you have any suspicion of shallow submucosa invasion, do it. If you have tumor with depressed area, do it. If you have large protruded lesion, do ESD. If you have mucosal tumor with submucosal fibrosis, do ESD. If you have a sporadic localized tumor within ulcerative colitis, you also do ESD. And if you have local residual or recurrent early cancer after resection, so let's say you did EMR or e before, and now you have a reset, like recurrence of early cancer, you should always go to ESD. These guidelines came in 20, 2015. I think it's very bold and it's very hard for us to enforce that in the United States because we did not, we do not have yet enough providers who learn ESD that we can apply that. If we really put this in the guidelines and it's so hard because when you are writing the guidelines, it's not only you are advising doctor about the best practice, you might get into, like stuff could be legal, like lawyer will use it and tell the doctor why you didn't do ESD. Well, if we don't have enough trained physician in the United States to do ESD, we cannot in a wider scale say this has to be done. And the provider who are doing colonic ESD in the United States, there are not that many yet. We you know we have um, we have maybe few of them, but we don't have enough uh, to enforce the guidelines the same like the Japanese one. But I thought to show you the Japanese guidelines uh, because it is interesting how they think about ESD. So the European guidelines for um, 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 colonic ESD, any lesion of depressed morphology, a regular or non-granular surface, especially of the lesion more than two centimeter. So these are examples of lesion removed by colonic ESD. That's you can see here fibrotic lesion, uh, appendiceal orifice. That's granular lateral spreading more than three centimeter. You can see this one is six centimeter with large dominant nod nodule. And that's one here is what? This is non-granular lateral spreading tumor. You can see how flat the surface is. This is a lesion in a patient with uh, IBD, sporadic lesion, IBD lesion. So these are all examples of lesion you can remove by chronic ESD. So now since we talked about all of this, I would like you to predict the diagnosis here. We're seeing a lesion. Actually, it is non-granular with granular, so that's what we call mixed granular, non-granular. You can see the granular part in the back, the non-granular part in the front, and you can tell here that this lesion have two components to it. Uh, I would wonder, you know, what you guys would think this lesion is based on what you're seeing. This is how it looked like a fluted ESD for the same lesion. The answer this came back as tubular villus adenoma was focal area of high grade dysplasia, margins were negative, and it was negative for cancer. So that was a focal high grade dysplasia lesion. Let's go back to that lesion and see where do you think the focal high grade dysplasia was? It is here in the non granular part in the middle. So that's where your high grade dysplasia is. So you have to train your eyes in seeing all these changes. So uh, let's take a look about another lesion. That's another one. So same thing. It is bulky lesion, very bulky. A lot of people say this is an ugly lesion, you know. 
um, it is uh, elevated and this how it looked like after we removed it by ESD. Uh, surface is margin is clean, but I will go back and focus on that lesion again. And if we go a little bit here, we will find that it is non-granular, uh, mostly with slightly early depression here. And most likely, even if you are not expert in ESD, you will know that this is cancer. This was a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma. It was invading 198 micron. You can see the invasion up to here. Luckily, that's the cautery margin. That's the length of submucosa. 1,140 micromillimeter were removed. You can tell here clearly that the ESD allowed us to go so deep that we had complete resection. No lymphovascular or cranial invasion was noted. This lesion was removed like two years ago and no recurrence so far. Um, so as again, I'm saying early adenocarcinoma, they respond very well for ESD. These are the predictor of successful ESD. One of the main thing is submucosal fibrosis. If you have too much fibrosis, it takes you longer to do the procedure and most likely you're not as successful. You'll notice that the R0 and, a and, 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 and in block resection rate is higher in Japan than the United States because not most of the region they get have this submucosal fibrosis as we see here. So to predict the outcome, there's many studies. That's one of the studies I chose because it has a cl cl clinical model to tell you how to predict the difficulty of ESD. So in this model, the tumor size, as you can see here, um, if it is larger than five centimeter, they give it two point, three to five, one point. If it's taking two thirds of the circumference, two point. If it's in the cecum, this additional point. Any flexure, hepatic flexure, splenic stuff, two points. Closer to the line, one point. If the morphology is non-granular, one point. And then you collect all of this and you want to see easy, difficult, or very difficult. And you can see here anything more than four is very difficult. So if you have a large tumor that's in hepatic flexure, most likely the very difficult will be very hard. And you can see here the probability of successful ESD within 60 minutes for very difficult tumor is like very, very low. It's around 16%. So you have to know that and you have to realize that and you have to start to predict um, your lesion, how long it takes you. One of the biggest problem again is people underestimate the time needing to do some of these cases. This is my last slide, and this one about when to consider surgical resection. And uh, basically, I'm talking now about not when you see the tumor and see they're already invasive and the patient has lymph node. No, I'm talking about when you did ESD, you thought everything is good, you completely removed the tumor, and it came back with R0 negative, you're still gonna send the patient for surgery if they have poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Or if you see signet ring, anytime you see the word signet ring cell carcinoma, no matter how good you did the ESD, this patient will need some sort of adjuvant, chemotherapy, or surgery. So I have few cases that my pathologist would be so worried about mucinous carcinoma. Having mucin is a problematic, knowing that you know there is uh, too much mucin in the tumor, make you know that's a high risk of lymph node metastasis. So when you see the word mucinous carcinoma, that's something you worry about. Anytime you have a deep submucosal invasion or lymphovascular invasion seen in the slide, and this sometimes would be interesting that your pathologist would say, I saw the lymphovascular invasion on the slide. And definitely when you see that, you should consider surgery. Having said that, sometimes it's not easy to determine if this was really LVI or not. And then there's another term called uh, intermediate to high-grade tumor budding. And, uh, and that term indicate that the tumor have uh, almost like buds coming out of it. And if you see that, it's also risk that these tumors will go to the lymph node. So if you read your pathology report, you see any of these terms, consider sending the patient for multitask, uh, like for um, um, like your, your old tumor report to discuss it more. So now we are wrapping the module two. Uh, and in module two, basically to summarize it, it's mainly about knowing what to resect and what not to resect. We started by talking about the um, Japanese criteria 
and we talked about the first and holy grail, which is the absolute criteria. Tumors less than two centimeter, well differentiated. Japanese started to expand it, undifferentiated but too small, two centimeter. Ulcerated lesion less than three centimeter. Differentiated tumor up to three centimeter. Submucosa invasion of differentiated tumor only on the upper third of submucosa. That's called expanded criteria. They couldn't expand it beyond that. Beyond that, actually, it was problematic. When we did the meta-analysis, we found even submucosal tumor in the expanded criteria have 2.5% risk of recurrence. So that's something you discuss with your patient. Squamous cell carcinoma is an indication of the removal of the tumor as long as it's superficial or SM1. Adenocarcinoma, if it is limited and there's no, like, uh, it's nodular, then you can remove that by ESD. Uh, colonic lesion, now we know about it. Fibrotic lesion, submucosa invasion, granular lateral spreading with prominent nodule or heterogeneous nodule or larger than three centimeter, okay to do ESD. Non-granular LST, you just go right away for doing ESD. Understand that even after you remove the lesion, you can have R0 resection, which means resection with clean margin, but still is not curative because these lesions could be going to the lymph node. So you have to know all these factors that can lead to higher LVI, seeing a lymphovascular invasion in your biopsy, seeing signet treatment cell, seeing high-grade tumor budding, or seeing submucosa invasion beyond 1,000 micromillimeter in the colon, 500 in the stomach, 200 in the esophagus. All of these are factors that make you call your surgeon and tumor board and discuss the case. And finally, remember that if you go to the business of doing ESD right now, you are a GI oncologist. You have to know more about the oncology. You have to understand more about the next step of treatment this patient. And you have to build a team of surgeon and oncologists to be your backup and plan. And also, if you don't have the bandwidth to screen this patient, you should send them for um, you know oncologists who will do PET scan, especially for one who have T1 tumor, because no matter how you think the curative resection is, patients have to have a follow-up for up to three to five years, especially with esophageal adenocarcinoma, uh, to make sure there is no recurrence. Uh, with that slide, I will stop and say thank you uh, for listening to this discussion. It looks like we had 60 attendees and they have been there from the beginning to now. And now we're gonna open the stage for questions. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. You're welcome. All right. So um, again, this is approved for four AMA Category 1 credits and four CNE credits um, by completing both of the workshops tonight and on Wednesday. To obtain your CE credits, you'll go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash INIT. You'll need to register at the site, complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to print a provisional certificate. A final certificate of completion will be issued at uh, the completion of the final session, um, and support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. And the archive version or the on-demand version will be available at www.initiative-patientsafety.org. Uh, the on-demand version will be available mid-February and will be accredited for physicians and nurses. And with that, we'll get started with some questions. We just received lots of questions, so uh, great talk. All right, um, so let's start with, what is the limit as to the size of the rectal lesion that could be removed and blocked through the anus? Wow, that's, uh, I, uh, you know, if you look at my previous slide here, and I can go back, we, I removed up to 15 centimeter. I you know as long as the lesion is benign, and I, I would say that if you do good inspection and find that some of this granular blood are spreading in the rectum, they really spread, they can take even two thirds of the circumference and they become like 15, 16 centimeter and they're still benign. That's only, I see that happening in the rectum. So basically the limit, uh, I would say there is no specific limit. However, uh, the larger the lesion, the higher chance of having cancer. The largest benign rectal tumor that I removed myself that did not have cancer, that was just granular respirating was 15 centimeter. 
I know kids report of up to 20 centimeter size areas removed. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe you touched on this, but how can we determine the exact depth, whether it's an SM1 or SM2, before the procedure? Yes, I, I, that's a great question because you before the procedure, you wouldn't know. That is a criteria we we'll know after the procedure, but be, during the procedure, you will look for the subtle clue for how deep the lesion goes. What are the subtle clues? The breast area. The more depressed the area, that's the more that SM2. If you find this uh, larger irregular blood vessels in MPI, uh, as we call CODO5 or GNAT3, this all what lead us that this is a deeper tumor. But you really wouldn't know 100% till you remove the lesion and send it to the pathologist. So a lot of time, you will ESD could be diagnostic as much as it is curative because there is this lesion who will be in between, uh, that they are not really uh, that deep that they're going to the muscle layer and you have a stricture or narrowing that you go in and say, wow, this is a deep tumor. But they are uh, superficial, but not superficial enough. And in this situation, you will undergo ESD, send it to the pathology and wait. And that's why it is very really important for the pathologist to measure the submucosa and see how deep the tumor going in the submucosa. And that's also how important for you as an endoscopist when you are doing dissection. And next session, we're going to talk about the technique is that you go as deep in the submucosa as you can so that you can uh, remove as large part from the submucosa so that you can ensure like, and know how is this lesion is in the upper third or middle third. How the pathologist would know upper third and middle third when they're not removing the full thickness, uh, they know it by... Uh, historically, we know that it is the submucosa is around 1,500 micromillimeter. So the first 500 is the upper third, second 500 is the middle third. Most of the specimen, as you can see in the picture I, I showed earlier, my, sub, my submucosa was around 1,000 micromillimeter. Uh, so if you can get to 700, 1,000, then you are getting SM1 and SM2, which is very good. Uh, it allow you to, to be able to determine the depths of invasion. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, another question. How long will it take the entire team to learn the ESD process, would you say? Um, I would say they wouldn't feel comfortable with it and very until at least one year. And doing it this year, maybe between 20 to 30 cases. Uh, if you really have one to two teams consistently working with you, they will feel comfortable quickly. Um, so it's all about consistently having the same people. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, one of our uh, audience members has a question regarding module one. Um, it says, you discuss, discussed about the stepwise fashion of ESD learning curve and the number of cases required um, animal lab training. What is your recommendations about live endoscopy courses or even online mo modules? Any particular suggestions? So live endoscopy courses, um, like I would say for ESD, the more you watch, the better you'll get. If you're able to watch videos online on YouTube, unedited and edited, they will help. If you're able to attend, uh, like go somewhere with somebody doing proctorships and watch cases, this would be good and would help. If you are able even to travel outside the country to Japan and Korea and high volume center, and we used to do that before, but now I would say in the United States, you will find a lot of high volume center. Um, any one of you who are attending, you're welcome to visit me at Baylor St. Luke's. Every Tuesday, we do four to five ESDs. So you can come and watch if you want to have more experience. And, uh, you know, we're opening our arm for anyone who want to learn the technique uh, to help you. Um, but I would say 20 hours in animal lab, attend at least five to six courses. This is what I did, at least five courses or five workshops. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, for pull, uh, colonic polyp recurrence, the Japanese guideline recommends ESD for any size lesion. However, in the table you mentioned ESD for larger lesions, uh, larger than 20. Um, I'd like to know your personal approach to the residual polyp or abnormal appearing scar after resection. Would you proceed with an ESD based on the size? That's a beautiful question because honestly, I have been thinking about it for a long time. So. Uh, if you have a scar 
and it's a small scar, like one centimeter scar, you're going to say it's not worth it to do ESD. Then you try to do EMR, and guess what happened? You're just like sliding over it, not able to do it, and you end up um, just not doing a good job. So I start, anytime I have a, a scar and recurrence over the scar, I do ESD. But if you want to be cheap, you can use the tip of the snare and use it to do cut as if you're doing ESD and do pre-cut, which is another technique called pre-cut EMR. So you can go in a circle around it, then you can put your snare around. If you're going to use pre-cut EMR, make sure uh, that you inject into the normal area and make your pre-cut in the normal area so that you can go deep enough so that when you put your snare, you can take everything uh, inside. So make a wise, nice white target around it, make a circle and put your snare around it. That's uh, a pre-cut EMR technique. Beautiful. Thank you. Um... And I know you did touch upon this, but specifically, what is your advice for someone starting out um, from the very beginning? Yeah, so someone starting ESD, I, I, I would like to restress, we talked about it in the lecture, but it's nice to just remind everyone, no, it is a long journey. Don't get disappointed if it takes you time to learn because others had to go through that too. Uh, be a very good communicator with your team and the hospital administration. Uh, do not jump into very tough lesion at the beginning, but also do not shy away from doing things. So you cannot wait for two years to do get the perfect lesion, so you have to have this balance. Uh, build a strong EMR referral so that you can convert it into ESD. And lastly, monitor your success. Know your R0 resection rate and N block resection rate. Wonderful, thank you. Um, sometimes there's a problem in identifying planes, specifically fibrosis versus muscle layer. Any advice? Yeah, so that's what come with the training. And I would say one of the things I notice, uh, and now because I train more B1 ESD, when you start dissecting, you get like so involved and tuck, 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 you want to cut, 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 cut. And I see this happening a lot. You cut fast and you end up cutting the muscle layer, especially in fibrosis. So when you see fibrosis, that's when you slow down. The problem is you're going to see some of these experts who are doing the procedure, their eyes already got trained. The same like when you do endosonography or EUS, you get so good in it after you do thousands of them. But if you didn't do thousands, you might not be able to see the difference. So what you do, water irrigation, uh, orient yourself, come back a little bit and say, this is my mucosa, that's my muscle layer, I'm going to follow the muscle layer, see where exactly meet the mucosa, and this is where I dissect. You dissect very slow and carefully, cut by cut, and open it. Aim your knife away from the submucosa and aim it exactly in the middle and not just go deep into the muscle layer. Uh, so if you aim your muscle to aim your knife toward the muscle layer, that's when perforation will happen. So in five process, you have to be slower than what you think. Just very slow, clean your lens, take the scope out and clean the lens and go in again, suction all the smoke, all of this will help you to identify and delineate the layers. Uh, and you can inject, and as much as you inject, sometimes injection doesn't work, but sometimes if you just take your knife out and put the needle, inject exactly where the muscle meets the submucosa, maybe this will open up the submucosa for you a little bit. But I realize there's certain situation that you cannot differentiate the muscle layer from the fibrosis, and when that happens, you will just see the normal area and cut just above the muscle layer carefully. Wonderful, thank you. Just have a few more questions here. Um, any advice if um, someone's institution doesn't have an animal lab? Yes, so there's many courses. I would say uh, there are courses. We have a course, for example, on April 28th, um, and that will be open uh, very soon for anyone who's interested. Dr. Dragunov has another course. I would say there is six or seven ESD courses uh, that offer animal lab with explain. Then you can talk to some of the uh, industry sponsor. And uh, the industry, most of the company did, uh, companies did a good job uh, uh, making uh, this process available that they can get you an animal endoscope and uh, they can also get you the explant. Uh, having animal lab is not that hard. So I'll tell you in my unit, the animal lab is simply 
an endoscope that is designed to be worked for animals. So we invested in one of the oldest scope. Then we say that is our animal lab scope. It is processed by itself, far away from anything else, only used for animal product. And we can bring explant, you can order it online. There's a lot of companies that can send you uh, this frozen big stomach. And now you have your endoscope and you have that big stomach, you can have your own animal lab. So you don't have to build the facility anymore. You just have to designate scope. And if you cannot even get a scope to be your animal lab scope, some of that your reps can help you identify uh, how to rent one of these uh, scopes, uh, or even they can provide it to you for free. Also, ASGE have courses uh, that provide that and have animal labs. And uh, uh, there's also other courses run through industry sponsors. So there's uh, plenty of opportunities to have animal lab training, even if you don't have one. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I believe this is the last question. Um, are there any instances where you did an ESC for a lesion that you predicted to be an SM1, but it turned out to have cancer even at the resection site? Yes, uh, uh, so it happens sometimes both situation that you start dissecting, you think you are fine, and then you find that the tumor is so deep that you're almost cutting in the tumor. That's usually happening in your early experience. You don't want that to happen to you. You don't want to start cutting and you discover you're cutting in a deep tumor. When you get experience, and that's why we say you have to look at your curative resection rate. What curative resection rate means that whatever tumor you're removing, you have a cure resection, which means you cannot just impart and remove in a lot of non like deeper lesion and I can say, oops, this was deep, oops, this was, you cannot do that. You really have to know what you're doing. So yes, that can happen, but this should not happen that often. What the most common scenario that you think that this lesion is limited to SM1, and then when you send it to the pathologist, they found that it's going to SM2 and it is, or going to the lymph node, which is perfectly acceptable by the way. And in this situation, ESD, and this situation is considered as a diagnostic. But if the tumor going to the muscle layer, you should be able to know that. You should be able to see the beckering, you should be able to see the narrowing of the lumen and other things that tell you this is not an ESD case. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I'll pass it back over to Tracy. Thank you, Dr. Ottman, and thank you, Christina, for such a great session tonight. Uh, we'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's session. Just a reminder for Modular 3 and 4, everyone has been automatically registered for the January 20th, 5th session at 7 p.m., and you are going to receive a reminder email before this session. For our survey, please uh, complete the survey upon the conclusion of this webinar. You'll be presented with the online survey. Please keep your web browser open and complete the survey. And we would like to thank everyone for attending today's section. And again, Dr. Ottman, thank you so much. And we will see everyone uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks.